Good afternoon and welcome to Tuesdays in the Chapel. We are very glad to have you join us in worship this afternoon. I'm Pastor Gordon Johnson. My wife and I are volunteers here at Scarrett Bennett Center. And like I say, we are so very thrilled to have you join us today. Our guest preacher today is Reverend Dr. Paula Smith. Dr. Smith is a senior pastor at Gordon Memorial United Methodist Church, as well as the founder of Steal Away Women, LLC, and a physical therapist and holistic health expert. Throughout her life and career, Paula has always been passionate about being a force for good. She uses her faith and background in the health and wellness industry in order to empower people to live a better, healthier life. Most notably, Paula combines the perks and insights of Western medicine with a biblical perspective. This unique dichotomy enables her to provide people with a full rounded holistic approach targeting, targeting not only the body, but also the mind and spirit of people. Integrating her experience as a licensed physical therapist and an ordained elder in ministry uniquely qualifies Paula to work at the intersection of faith and health with people of all walks of life. And Dr. Smith, thank you very much for being with us today. Loving God, who speaks to us through your scriptures and in the collective wisdom of your people throughout the ages, help us to hear anew what you would speak to us this day. For your word is always fresh, a message of life and hope in the world that needs to know and heed your will. Through Christ the living word and your spirit of illumination, who with you is the truth that sets us free. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through town. A man there named Zacchaeus, a ruler among tax collectors, was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he couldn't because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus, who was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to that spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down at once. I must stay in your home today. So Zacchaeus came down at once, happy to welcome Jesus. Everyone who saw this grumbled, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I repay them four times as much. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this household because he too is a son of Abraham. 
The human one came to seek and save the lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. It is always a privilege to be here and to see some of you I know and some that I am seeing for the first time. Um, as far as that introduction, there's an old saying that says what you could have said is, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. But today we've, we will look at a familiar text. Many of us have heard the story of Zacchaeus, right? We've heard it since a child. All right, so now I'm going to ask you to help me with this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, come down. For I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. We all remember that story, right? If you grew up in the church, I know you know it and you've heard it before. But today I'm going to ask that we not look at this story through the eyes of a child, but that we look at it from, through our grown-up adult eyes. That we look at it in keeping it in its original context to see how it might inform our ideals, our political views today. What would happen if we dare perceive our political views through the lens of the Lordship of Christ? How would we look at the other? How would we hear the other? How would we show kindness and mercy to those who look different, talk different, act different, and yes, even have different political views? Would the great political breach be repaired if indeed we followed biblical principles, not only in our vertical relationship with God, but also with our horizontal relationship with our sisters and brothers? Oh, if we dare look at Micah 6, 8 and take it seriously. Oh, if we dare to love kindness and do justice and walk humbly with God, I believe that it would change this current political environment we find ourselves in. This place where we look at difference as, as deficit. Hmm. What would a Jesus-informed political view look like in our homes, in our communities, and yes, even in our churches? This text challenges us as followers of Christ to ask the question, are we more committed to the kingdom of God or are we more committed to the kingdom of earth? Are we more committed to the kingdom of God or are we more committed to the kingdom of this earth? I have a news flash, breaking news for you today, church. Jesus was neither Democrat nor Republican. That may come as a surprise to some. No one political party is big enough to encapsulate all of who God is. So we need to stop trying to put God in our human-made boxes. God is bigger than that and bring God into the spaces that we have created. Yes, before I go on, I think maybe I should pray. <laughs> Dear God, we thank you for allowing us to gather here today to talk about one of the most hotly contested topics in our culture today. We ask you, O oh God, to open our hearts, our minds, to hear anew, so that we may be mere, not only hearers, but doers of your word. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen? Amen? How many of you would agree that politics today is just gone out the way? 
Well, it gets on your nerves sometimes. I don't know about you. Maybe my, my, my church family, y'all know I, I can get a little personal sometimes, but I, I can't speak for you, but I know that it does upset me every now and then. But I heard a story once of this elderly gentleman who was sitting on a park bench, maybe one of those like that's out here, a little shade. It was a beautiful day, sun shining. He was wearing a black hat and it said, with God, all things are possible. Before long, there was another elderly gentleman who walked by him and sat six feet from him on the other side of the bench. He also had on a black hat and his hat said, Forgiven, 1 John 1, 9. I love Jesus. They looked at each other for a moment, sizing each other up, didn't say anything, and both start looking straight ahead again. Arms folded, never saying a word to each other, but yet the tension was palpable between them. Finally, one of them just gives out this loud sigh, and then the other one jumps up and said, well, if you're going to talk about politics, then I'm leaving. And with that, he stormed off, leaving the other man alone. Many times we find ourselves in those places of high tension when it comes to politics today, where we're afraid to say something, whether to wear a mask or not to wear a mask, whether to get vaccinated or not get vaccinated. Look at how neighbors are turning against one another. I mean, you go in the grocery store, the road rage, even families are afraid to get together. And if you get together, let's not talk about politics. And even our churches, have been infected with this disease and this sin where we are no longer looking at each other as children of God, but rather we're looking at each uh, at, as the other. It seems like at times people are more willing to fight over the COVID-19 response or some other political concern waiting for you to say something so they could pounce on it to persuade you of their political ideologies. Conflict, tension. This current political climate is changing our culture. I need to say it again. This current political climate is changing how we treat one another. And if this climate, the lines of being in the world versus being of the world has gotten so blurred by our commitment to our political affiliations and candidates. And I'm just wondering if we as the people of God would be bold enough every now and then to say, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, I will follow the kingdom of God. See, at this time of Jesus in this story, the Jewish people were caught between the Roman government and the Jewish religious establishment. And here comes Zacchaeus, a tax collector. He wasn't well liked by Rome, but he was a pawn that was used in order to collect Rome's taxes. He wasn't liked by his own people because he was a thief and a traitor and charged more in taxes than what he deserved. He was caught in that political divide. You know how we do that between us and them. Those people, they, y'all know the terms we use, us versus them. Caught in the middle of that. <laughs> kind of sounds familiar to what we do to each other today. And so, yes, church, I, I must say that this may for many feel like pastors meddling a little bit. Ah, there's a story of these two elderly Southern women who were at a revival. They came and they sat in the front pew because they look forward to the revival every year. And when the preacher con condemned the sin of stealing, these two ladies shouted out, amen, brother. And when the preacher con con condemned the sin of lust, they yelled, preach it, you better preach it. And when the preacher condemned the sin of lying, they jumped to their feet and screamed, right on, brother, tell it like it is. But when the preacher condemned the sin of gospel, 
When the preacher condemned the sin of sitting silently instead of speaking about the, tr the truth, the two of them got very quiet. And they turned to each other and said, he's quit preaching now and he's gone to meddling. I do believe there needs to be a little bit more meddling going on in the church when the people of God are remaining silent when we see things that we know that are not right in the community. So I ask you a question today, which kingdom has your allegiance? Though there are many issues that divide us, let's stick with just this one, this one on our political views. There's so much strife and division and anxiety and anger and fear. Where's the righteous indignation that God has spoken about for us to speak up when we see things that are not in alignment with God? But let me also tell you, strife is not new in humanity. Throughout history, people have been divided over political power and control. But today we're invited to see how Jesus steps in right in the middle of all of this chaos and confusion and offers transformation and love. As you search scripture, you see Jesus over and over again crossing boundaries, forming unlikely friendships and relationships that do not respect the cultural political divide. We see in this story Jesus passing through Jericho. Many had come to hear him, but there was one man in particular, and remember Zacchaeus, as I said, he had problems from on both sides, but he was full enough of himself. He didn't matter, didn't matter to him what anybody else think or thought. And so this particular man, it said he climbed up in a tree. He was willing to go out on a limb, literally, to see Jesus. And Zacchaeus, as was read so wonderfully, Pastor Gordon, was a Jewish man. He was from the region. They knew who he was. He was wealthy. He had status and power. He was a tax collector used by the Roman govern government. And politically, the Jewish people at the time were under Roman occupation. See, Zacchaeus, in some circles, were very popular, and in others, he was not. He had gotten rich by beating out his own people, overcharging them. He was seen as a traitor. He had chosen political power as a way to get a leg up. Zacchaeus and the rest of the community caught right there between the Roman government and the Jewish religious establishment. And often it wasn't pretty. I ask you and myself today, what are the earthly kingdoms that we find ourselves caught in the middle of? I can't answer that for you, but there is a man named Jesus who will allow us to see ourselves. But a clue is if we look at our earthly kingdoms, we'll realize earthly kingdoms lead to division. But the heavenly kingdom leads to unity. Earthly kingdoms cause division. The heavenly kingdom reminds us of God's unity. We must be careful that we don't try to put God in our boxes and ourselves define what is right and what is wrong. It may surprise some of you to know, as I said earlier, Jesus, neither Republican nor Democrat, but there may be some of Jesus in all of those various camps. But can we come together on the common denominator of a God who loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him might live? We read in this story here that Zacchaeus was looking for Jesus, but Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Do we even think about God sees us when we're in the midst of the division? 
And not only did he see him, Jesus crossed the political aisle and said, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going to your house. And imagine how the people, you heard how they responded. Jesus is going to eat with a sinner? Don't Jesus know who he is? Doesn't he realize how he has cheated us? Is that the type of people that Jesus will hang out with? And it tells us, did not Jesus come for ones such as these? Do we not remember that we are all sinners saved by God's grace? When people put up a wall to divide, Jesus will put up a bridge to build unity. Jesus isn't limited by our political battle lines, willing to cross barriers, breaking cultural rules, and all for the reason of love. What's love got to do with it, church? Everything. Agape love. The love of God, the love that allowed Jesus to give up glory to come down in the form of babe, the love that allowed Jesus to remain nailed to the cross. We know it wasn't the nails that held him there. It was his love for us and all of humankind. We may draw lines in the sand and create clearly marked battle lines, but Jesus invites us to reach out in relationship. The love of Jesus is able to overcome all the differences that we create. Do we not know God sees diversity as beauty, fearfully and wonderfully made, all created in Jesus' name? And because Jesus' generous invitation to spend time with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was convicted of his sinful ways and changed his behavior, behavior. If only we were more focused on being right relationally instead of being right politically, we would be a much better witness for God. William T. J. Tom said, be careful how you live. You may be the only Bible some person ever reads. If you were to look in the mirror right now, what would you say? Are you living a life from your political stances that would be pleasing in God's sight. If that's the only thing someone sees and hears, what are we saying about a God of love? I think it's time for us as the children of God to rethink how we so easily go with the waves and be able to take a stand for God. Would it be that God truly came that we all might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus gives us a blueprint on how we're to love God and how we're to love each other. No matter the differences that exist between you and someone else, that person is still a child of God. As people of faith, I ask again, which kingdom has your allegiance? the earthly or the heavenly? Do your political beliefs support division or unity? Have you limited God by our human battle lines and drawing lines in the sand? Are we willing to keep our eyes stayed on Jesus, focused on Jesus, knowing that Jesus will empower us to cross whatever lines we have drawn in the sand? That's what I believe Jesus informed politics will do, to see others as made in the image of God. And notice, I'm not saying that we have to agree with one another. Did anybody say I have to agree with your beliefs? 
But what I'm saying is I have to love you even if I don't agree with you. Now, sometimes I got to love you from a distance, <laughs> but I still <laughs> have to love you. <laughs> Do we still believe Jesus has the power to transform us? I want to invite you today to choose to be more committed to the cause of Christ than to be more committed to be more committed to the cause of Christ than to the cause of politics, race, religious affiliation, or any of the other things that divide us. Let it not only be in the words we say, but in the actions we take. We are called to be one. We are called to be one. Let's not let our sinful nature pull us apart. And as I come to a close, there's one thing that I would ask that you all would do. I ask that you would close your eyes right now and think about one person that you are at politically odds with. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will allow you to make a conscious effort this week to build relationship, to repair the breach with that person in some kind of a way, whether it be a call, a text, a card, coffee, or meal, but seek to find common ground in Jesus. The Bible has a lot to say about these divisions that are coming up that cause tension. Each and every time though, with these divisions, when they're addressed, there is a common denominator, and that common denominator is Jesus. That is the common element that will help us to navigate the tensions in a way that honors God and honors people. Jesus, when we allow him to be in every situation, in every circumstance, he will lead us to a way of peace and joy and hope. That, my sisters and brothers, is what I believe that Jesus-informed politics will do for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Our hymn of response is hymn number 2238, in the blue book that's in the pew in front of you, hymn 2238, in the midst of new dimensions, we'll be singing verses one, three, and four.
receive the benediction. God's peace go with you into the worlds in which you live. Be nurtured by the time of gathering. Be faithful in the time apart. Love and serve each other in the name of the faithful God who calls us to be God's people and the blessings of God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier be with us always. Amen.